This is another day of a real talk. We have uh, one of our good friends here. And I want to also say thank you to our sponsors at Park Bank. Thank you for all that you do. And we have a special guest. She's sort of like family to me. See, people don't know. This is a secret. This is people don't know. So she's kind of a family member for me. I used to work for this this wonderful woman um, from my age, and I've been there a long time ago. But she is someone I, I sincerely love and support, and uh, she's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful woman. Uh, Senator Tammy Baldwin, how are you? I am doing well, all things considered. Um, Life has changed a lot, as it has for everyone. Um, But working hard, uh, trying to do what I uh, am accustomed to doing uh, with a lot of traveling, but uh, it's a lot of calling now. (laughs) A lot of calling. So I know you used to go back to D.C. once a week, like back and forth. Yeah. You're not doing that now, right? Are you just at home now? I am. So I actually, after we passed that last major bill, which I suspect we'll talk about, but uh, I drove back because I was thinking that I could probably uh, socially distance a little bit more easily there than uh, than on planes and in airports, etc. So I got here uh, and I've been here pretty much ever since. Wow. That has to be so different for you, right? That's a different lifestyle. You've been doing this for a long time, every week. Absolutely. Although this week, last week was sort of telecommuting chaos. This week, we've begun to return to like a more normal schedule. So when I, if I had been in D.C., we would be having a caucus meeting on Tuesdays at 1. So yesterday we had a caucus conference call and everyone participated. A little bit more hectic when people are trying to get recognized to speak and you can't see them. So everyone's like, put me on your list, put me on your list. Um, But uh, we got through it. And uh, other meetings that I have regularly have been put back in their time slot. So poor colleagues of mine from Hawaii who have to wake up at all odd hours to participate, but it's only an hour difference for me. Yeah, and they're still in Hawaii. I mean, you know, they're, yeah. still, they're, still, they're still in Hawaii. That's right. So you mentioned the, the stimulus package. You know, how are you perceiving that it's going? I'm talking to a lot of people in the community, a lot of business people, small business people, nonprofits, actually, who are applying to get that funding. So yes. is, is it going to what you thought would be going at this point? Or how are you feeling about it? Yeah, well, first, if you look at the fact that we put together and passed a $2.2 trillion, that's the estimate these days, measure to respond to this pandemic and um, you know the health crisis as well as the economic uh, disaster, the fallout from it. Um, you know, in, in, in about two weeks, there, uh, we knew there would be bumps and problems, um, but uh, a lot of it is just so incredibly essential and it requires a lot of oversight. And so we kind of switched from legislating mode to oversight mode. Um, so in terms of small businesses, and I mean, you have such a long history of advocacy for small businesses in with all the different hats you wear. Um, we're finding that uh, when the first part of the Paycheck Protection Program was stood up on April 3rd, um, it... it um, it requires people to work with lenders, and so you don't get the bottleneck of calls right to the SBA where, uh, although we did hear plenty of accounts of phone calls being dropped and being on hold and websites crashing. That said, um, it was a little bit more decentralized when the PPP program, the Paycheck Protection Program, was stood up on the 3rd. Um, But we're already beginning to hear about some of the shortfalls and um, problems with it, which uh, are going to be really key for us to address. So, you know, talk about the the big banks um, uh, are taking a huge role in all of this, but they, um, in too many instances, are limiting themselves to prior customers, prior um, uh, clients. And uh, that leaves a lot of people out. And then there's so many who work with non-traditional financial um, agencies, um, you know, minority-serving financial institutions, the CDFIs, 
um, and others that aren't a part of this SBA program. And we're going to have some real inequities in who gets assistance and who doesn't if we don't address these and address them quickly. Um, there are uh, still um, issues, for example, uh, farms, uh, you know, do they qualify, do they not? Traditionally, there's been a separate type of emergency fund in the USDA, um, and it works better for the farm structure, but um, this, this program, we're going to have to make it work for farms also. Uh, at least in the near term before we can take more action. So it's a wide variety of problems we're seeing with it. Um, and then on April 10th, coming up in two days, they're going to stand up um, another piece of this for people who um, are uh, self-employed and, um, I, you know, just uh, sort of the full program will be in effect by next week. And we'll have a lot more data very quickly. Wow. You are the first person and we've talked to everyone that's mentioned that the inequality, how this could be actually passed out to people like the CDFIs or the community banks. I, n I never thought about that, but that makes so much sense. And But it scares me that you're the only person I've talked to who mentioned that. Um, so we need to make sure we educate people on that a little bit more because yeah. no one's brought that to my attention. Yeah, no, we're going to have to make sure that um, SBA's guidance um, really uh, both uh, has big expectations for the big banks that they can't just uh, stick with people who've you know had the uh, capacity to work with them for a long time. I mean, we bailed them out uh, a decade or so ago. Um, this should be uh, uh, an understanding that they have to really uh, do do better. And then we have to make sure that these other um, smaller institutions that the SBA has never worked with before are prepared to be partners and part of the solution. Because otherwise, it's not going to be an equitable distribution of uh, loans and grants. And uh, we need to be there for all of our small businesses. Yeah, because we know, especially when it comes to communities of color, there's going to be the ones hit the hardest a lot of times. Uh, yes. But um, thank you for bringing that up. That is something I'm going to advocate a little bit more about. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. So I know that you brought up some legislation, right, about helping students or children who are 16 and above and making sure that they get some more of the money because right now they don't get it. Is that is that what I'm hearing? Right now they don't get part of the stimulus? Yeah. Okay, so this is the direct payments issue. So uh, you heard uh, that we came together on an agreement that every adult uh, should get twelve hundred dollars, um, yep. and uh, every uh, child in a family should get five hundred dollars. Um, this is like an emergency, likely a one-time only, but you know it could be renewed, and it's being run through the IRS because the IRS. Um, in, in many cases knows where to get you your refund if you have a refund coming to you. And so it, it seemed like the fastest, most deliberate way to do it. And then, of course, you start to realize that there's exceptional cases. You know, not everyone is banked. And so if you can't do a direct deposit, um, you have to send checks out by mail. Um, you have to make sure you have accurate addresses. And then they do all of this based on prior year's tax filings. And I bring that up because um, folks who are on, say, Social Security or Social Security disability, um, uh, some veterans, uh, others who make little enough income are not required to file a tax, uh, re uh, re um, tax return. That's what I'm trying to say. And um, so we have to make sure those folks can get the direct deposit also. And so that's one piece they're working out. But um, I'm working with my colleague, Tina Smith from Minnesota on this issue you raise, which is what about somebody who is 17, 18, even older, who is living at home and is declared as a dependent on their parents' taxes? Um, when that happens, um, they are neither viewed as a child <laughs> or as uh, an independent adult who could qualify for the $1,200 uh, 
uh, uh, direct deposit, direct payment. And that's a big uh, issue that we have to figure out. Right now, you know, especially with many college students without incomes returning home because their college campuses are closed, um, their parents are supporting them, they'll be on their parents' um, tax return. It, we got to make sure that they um, have uh, a piece of these uh, direct payments because um, they're as important as every other person. Do you know when the direct payments are, can they, people can expect them, the, the $1,200? Do we have a timeline on that? So my um, last report was that the IRS would begin the payments, um, the direct deposit payments by the end of this week. And I will be really oh, eager to hear um, from constituents uh, some confirmation that they're beginning to receive those funds. Um, those are, of course, the simplest people who already have a routing number and account number registered with, their, uh, with the IRS because they filed their return. Um, then, you know, they're going to start uh, uh, mailing out checks to those for whom they have addresses. And then we're really trying to make sure that the IRS works with the Social Security Administration directly since anyone who receives a social security payment also gets either a check or a direct deposit, they can work together and work this out, just data matching, figure out who didn't file a return, but who does get social security income, and they should be able to work it out um, pretty expediently, I hope. Yeah, well... That, if it, people are already getting it, that's extremely fast for the federal government to work that fast. I'm, I'm shocked. Wow. <laughs> Some things are happening uh, fairly quickly. Other things are painfully slow. Uh, <laughs> and it's an emergency. And so you just, um, you lament, you, it's frustrating, the things, especially on the healthcare side where so many supplies equipment, other things are needed right away, tests. Right. Well, that you led to my next question about health care. I know you've been, since I've known you talking about health care issues, um, I know that's one of, been your, one of your core causes. How does ACA impact the people right now who have issues, health issues? Is there, is there a, a court, like, are they connected at all right now? Is, is there a way that they're connected, that people who are health unhealthy, who need help, that ACA can help them at this point? There's so many um, issues that connect um, the Affordable Care Act and the pandemic that we're going through. Um, but actually, on that front, I have um, you know, a, a lot of criticism for this administration. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you that you know, they're in court right now, still trying to argue, ultimately they'll argue before the Supreme Court, supposedly in a session yet this year, to repeal it and overturn it in its entirety. Um, this is the measure that called for every insurer to cover people with pre-existing conditions. I can promise you coronavirus and COVID-19 will be a pre-existing condition. We cannot afford to have um, uh, the administration continue with this assault on health care that so many rely on. Secondly, we've been calling on the administration to reopen a special enrollment period for this insurance um, in light of the pandemic. Um, we have um, certainly people who are uninsured. Uh, the administration for a long time has been trying to push people into what I call junk plans, which are bare bones uh, plans that don't have to cover people with pre-existing conditions. Um, boy, does everyone need a comprehensive health care plan these days. And so we wish that they would open a special enrollment period. Um, also, people who are losing their jobs and are not able to, um, you know, retain their benefits or they get a sort of scaled back what's called a COBRA program, which is supposed to bridge the gap between jobs. If they could enroll in a much more comprehensive insurance plan like is offered in the Affordable Care Act marketplaces, they would be better off. So there's a lot of intersection between um, 
our health plan and uh, this pandemic. Uh, I will say though that um, because this is a public health crisis, um, we are doing everything we can to make sure everyone, regardless of insurance status, is able to get tested and not have to bear the brunt of those costs and is able to get treatment um, and you know, helping the hospitals be able to provide that directly. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm assuming that you're aware of all the things going on in Milwaukee um, yeah. with, with especially attacking you know, black, black folks who are actually, this is hitting big time for a lot of preconditioned issues, I'm guessing, right? The underlying issues that they've had before. Are, are there things that you think we could have done beforehand to address some of these issues that are happening now with our, from our government? I think there's stuff we could have done beforehand, there's stuff we are doing now and need to do now, and there's stuff that we can do in the future. So um, let me say that um, one of the really important things that I think Milwaukee has done in their public health department pre-pandemic is they identified racism as a public health issue. And so they're one of the few health departments, um, I think, perhaps nationally, that actually collects um, statistics uh, and data by race. And they're one of the few places that could easily identify early on that it was disproportionately the African-American community that was coming down with coronavirus and was being hospitalized. And ultimately, um, they're tracking uh, numbers of deaths uh, by race. And so it was powerfully important that they had identified uh, race and racism as a public health issue prior to all of this. We might not even be knowing that this is happening in other places too. But I think you have another, a, a couple of other issues. Yeah, if we had have closed healthcare disparities, um, you know, decades ago, um, the impact would probably have been much, much less. And then I think you look at a, a lot of ongoing issues. Um, I was talking, uh, I've had a chance to talk to a number of leaders in Milwaukee who were describing things like um, I, so many in the community are in jobs that don't allow social distancing and are considered essential jobs. We're talking about not only people who work in hospitals and clinics and nursing homes, but people driving the transit buses and people working in grocery stores, all deemed essential, but many in roles where they don't have the personal protective equipment that is being prioritized for first responders and people um, on the front lines with patients that they're treating every day. And so just proximity and um, having conditions in the communities that make it harder to be safer at home and to exercise um, social distancing, those are, are big factors um, that we'll have to understand. Just a couple other thoughts on this. Um, uh, one is that uh, I've joined and led a number of my colleagues in writing to the CDC and asking them to make available really, really granular data on the spread of this pandemic, um, including issues of age, gender, race, um, all sorts of things that will help us understand it better and take smarter and smarter actions as we move forward. I just think that's key. And uh, it's a shame that we haven't been doing that heretofore. Yeah, I'm actually shocked. Uh, we had County Zach Parisi on yesterday, and he mentioned that Dane County's trying to, or they're ramping up doing some of their racial data. But I'm shocked that now ev everyone's want to know this data. We want to know where this is impacting, who's this impacting, and if this happens again, how can we get ahead of it and make sure we're helping the communities that need to be helped quicker? Right? It's just That's it's right. common sense, but I know politics yeah. and common sense don't always go together sometimes. Well, and I have to say there's also... Um, this is an issue we've been tracking when we're working with the state public health officials, but um, I talked to many local leaders who are very frustrated that they couldn't get granular data from, granular data from the um, state even. 
And that has to do with their responsibility to protect um, uh, patient privacy under federal law. And so if you have three cases in a fairly rural county and you say, you know, here are the dots on the map of where these three people live, that's obviously a very different thing than this, um, what they're calling a heat map that's on the County of Milwaukee's website that really shows where the p pandemic is spreading um, with, uh, you know, they have a dashboard that just allows you to follow all this data. So we do have some real differences in how data is reported. Um, but I do think that we need to be uh, tracking it and it will, uh, you know, we need a lot of science-based and data-based and evidence-based decision-making, not um, the type of leadership that's more emotional or um, political. That's definitely not what we need right now. Well, talking about political, I, uh, you were keeping up with uh, the voting thing yesterday happened yes. the, um, when uh, Evers... Uh, Governor Evers said that we shouldn't have the election, and then you know a couple of people in the legislature said we should, and that could put a lot of people at risk. Actually, one of our reporters went, which I was not happy about, but he went anyways, and he was there on the front lines and seeing all these people there. He was kind of amazed how many people came out. Just the ne the impact that could have on people um, with the virus is sad. So, do you, what's your take on what happened for the election? Do, did you think we shouldn't have it, or what? Where were you at on that? Oh my goodness, I just think no one should ever have to choose between um, being healthy and safe and exercising their right to vote. It was wrong uh, to force people into that position and um, the, the um, Republican leaders in the state legislature were wrong not to take this up and um, uh, take uh, Wisconsinites out of that un untenable position. And frankly, I, I try not to criticize court rulings, but I have to go hard at both the Wisconsin Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court um, for not uh, recognizing that it was unsafe uh, and risky to hold an election during a pandemic. Um, they also, um, because of the litigation, there were so many changing rules and deadlines, et cetera. And so we do have um, any number of people who um, who cast um, ballots, say, that weren't witnessed um, because at one point in time a judge said that would be okay. And, um, I, you know, I, those are going to be ballots that aren't counted. Yeah. So there's other mishaps, too. It's sad. It's sad when we put... Politics over people. That's um, yeah. it's, it's really sad. Last question before I, I let you go here, Senator. Can we expect a, sim a stimulus too? I mean, like, because from my perspective, this is hitting now, but we're going to really see the impacts of this a month from now, even bigger, when people are actually not having those checks for about a month from now. Still, like you said, students are at home. That means the grocery bills are going up, all those things. Do you see another stimulus package happening? I definitely do. Um, some of these funds, um, like the small business account, is a limited fund, and it will probably be run through pretty quickly. There's already negotiations on Capitol Hill about um, adding additional funds to that. Um, you know, part of the idea of the stimulus is to the extent possible, wherever possible, if a small business can keep their employees on payroll with forgivable loans or grants, we want them to do that rather than um, cast them off into the unemployment insurance system and, um, you know, create greater demand there. And we think it'll be quicker to bring things back up if people still have their um, staff sort of associated and affiliated with their enterprise. Um, that said, uh, it is so clear to me that we can't reopen until we have widespread testing. Um, we'll have another shutdown uh, of our economy when the next wave rolls around. We'll open and shut and open and shut until we can have some real data and real knowledge of who's immune because they've had it already, of um, who's had it and recovered and has the antibodies. 
um, who's infected and be able to stop the spread and quarantine just those people rather than everybody. Um, those are all things that will require another Herculean public health infusion um, hand in hand with this um, infusion to help our small businesses and larger businesses. So I want to see them come together. And that's what we're trying to negotiate right now. Well, that's good to hear because this, like you said, this can happen to keep going like to August, September. We just don't know um, when yes. people will be able yeah. to re engage. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. You be Thank safe. Thank you so much. Thank yeah, you you'll be safe, safe too. Yes, I feel like I, well, I haven't seen you until forever, but I'm keeping up with you and all the wonderful stuff you're doing. Keep fighting a good fight and uh, hope you're taking care of yourself. Being yes, locked I in am. the house, hope you're doing something <laughs> physical and all that stuff. So thank you for joining us and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for another sort of real talk and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.